Hi there and welcome to a new episode of Extreme Banding, the slow YouTube camera channel dealing with various photographic nightmares. I am living in one of them right now, December in the north of Sweden, where there is so-so and the sun never rises. There's no time or place for photography, so what can you do? Think about which all mechanical rangefinder camera with a cost below 1000 euros you would like to use for the rest of your life, perhaps. The cheapest way to get into rangefinder photography is by buying a Soviet rangefinder camera. The reason for this is simply because the Soviets produced an extreme amount of them while Leica produced 350,000 Leica II Model Ds in total, the Soviets made 1.5 million copies of it. Up until 2002, Leica had produced about 2.8 million rangefinder cameras. Up until 1991, the Soviets produced about 11 million rangefinder cameras with Leica screw mount. They also produced Kiev contacts rangefinder cameras. Buying a Soviet camera is a lottery though, as few sellers on eBay are totally honest, and you never know what you will get, despite their 5 star ratings. One store that has not disappointed me yet is the Soviet camera store, and buying from there is also a way of supporting the Ukraine. As the Kievs are a bit big and awkward to hold, we will focus on the Soviet cameras with Leica screw mount. First off we have this Sorky 1, copy of the Leica 2 Model D with some small modification, mainly in how it looks. It is still 133mm wide and 67mm tall. Knob wind, which I really like, and a rotating shutter speed dial with speeds from 1 500th of a second to 120 or 125. No self timer or anything like that. Like a screw mount, so it can take a lot of lenses old lenses and some new Voigtlander lenses. Leica cameras are, most of them are flat on the top so you can place them upside down and this, well this copy is almost flat at least. This is beneficial if you load the camera from the bottom. So when you have the film spool which you can remove. Bottom loading is by a lot of people seen as well tedious but what you have to do you can count to 20 in these sprocket holes you cut them out like this and you put it on the spool and then just put it in the right way Of course this takes more time than more modern styles of loading, but since I at least don't shoot 100 images an hour when I'm shooting film, I think it's okay. Just pre-cut your film and it's not that much work. The upside of bottom loaders. Well, first you can see, you can check that everything's working all right by using the bulb and looking to see that the film winds on. You can also see on this camera how the film rewind knob rotates. Bottom loaders are 
about two millimeters less thick than the cameras with a hinged back or removable back something that actually makes a difference when holding these cameras for me i think the bottom loading is worth those two millimeters knob winding is actually pretty fast you can use one finger on a well-serviced camera just as fast as most lever winds separate viewfinders one rangefinder with one-to-one -one enlargement and a viewfinder corresponding to a 50 millimeter lens so here's the look from the rangefinder sorky cameras have a kind of a blue tint in the rangefinder window which increases contrast pretty small windows but the eye point is good the first evolvement of the Sorky one or Fed one, both Sorky and Fed made those. The first evolvement from Sorky was the Sorky C. The top plate got higher since they wanted to include flash sync. I don't know why they had to make it higher, but they did. They also added this dial that you know you can see what shutter speed you have both before and after you press the shutter, something which you can't on the Sorky ones or like a two model these for that matter. Still a bottom loader. Dimensions are the same as the Sorky one, except for the height. As you can see, just a bit higher. None of these cameras have strap plugs, which is a bit of a downside. Exactly the same viewfinder rangefinder system. And as you can see, you cannot put the camera upside down anymore. So no real point of that higher top plate except for one the knob wind is a bit more stable and as such i think this is the nicest knob wind on any camera actually this particular camera is also in super condition Next off, well, there were kind of two paths of evolvement on the Sorky factory. One was the Sorky 3, but here we have the Sorky 5, which is more of an immediate follow-up to the Sorky C. It has strap plugs. It is still a bottom loader. You can put it upside down, but it is not stable and it is not flat. Of course, the biggest thing is that they combined the viewfinder rangefinder window and this in a camera that is exactly as wide and thick as the original, but it is high, higher or taller, just as thin. And so, evolving this, they made a few mistakes, they added a lever wind which unfortunately is the weak spot of this camera. The shutter button was moved all the way to the right so as not to interfere with the wide rangefinder window. So it gets a little bit better to hold if you add a, a button there on the shutter. The combined rangefinder viewfinder, it has a view for 50 millimeter, magnification of 0.7, which I consider to be ideal, good eye point. You can see the whole frame in a relaxed way.
following the Sorky 5, which wasn't produced that long, just for a year, was the Sorky 6. And it added a lot of nice things. Most, first and foremost, the hinged back. So film loading is much easier. It also has a better winding lever as the Sorky 5 lever is very coarse even when serviced I think. It has a longer throw and I think it, it puts less pressure on the gears. It has the same wide rangefinder base but it has increased in size. It is now two millimeters thicker and a couple of millimeters taller than before. Still a pretty small camera. It weighs 550 grams while the Sorky 5 weighed 500 grams. The Sorky 1 is at 410 grams. So the weight gain is clearly noticeable. The lever doesn't stay out, so you kind of have to catch it with the small bent arm. Well, you, you can get a hold of it, but it's, it's not like one of the better lever wind cameras out there. The viewfinder is like on the Sorky 5, although my copies have been a bit more blue while the Sorky 5 have been more, what do you say, red, yellow or purple maybe and I have preferred the Sorky 5 viewfinders I have seen. Here we have the two cameras. Sorky 6 is almost a bit prettier but it is a bit bigger. It might not look like much but you can actually notice it when using the cameras. The width is still the same, but the hinged lever adds a bit. The strap plugs are placed on the sides on the Sorky 5, but a bit to the front on the Sorky 6, so it tilts backwards if you have a small lens attached. You can, however, solve this by just attaching the strap to one side then you won't have that problem. Here we have the wi winding levers as you can see the Sorky 6 goes further the Sorky 5 has a shorter throw which might seem good as the Sorky 6 has a rather long throw but the Sorky 5 is so coarse when winding there is a myth that you can damage the shutter by releasing it without a lens attached on the Sorky 5. I have tested both versions of the Sorky 5, released the shutter multiple times without a lens attached, without any damage. And when I have opened them up, I cannot see how there could be any damage from that. So I consider it a myth, but if you do it, you do it at your own risk, of course. Sorky 5 is also available in this version with red lettering and a square rangefinder window. 10 grams lighter, but to adjust the vertical of the rangefinder, you have to remove the top plate. So adjusting the rangefinder perfectly is easier in the later version. The other development line started with the Sorky 3. Here we have the Sorky 3M, which is the follow-up to the Sorky 3. This is a camera that has grown. It has kept the overall look of the first Sorky, the Leica copy. It has added strap lugs. It still has a knob wind and a very nice knob wind if you have a good copy. It has one thousand of a second and the 3M has slow speeds on the top dial. The Sorky 3 had them separate with a slow speed dial on the front. Having it all on the top makes it nicer to hold 
but this feature made them prone to error. Here we have a removable back, not as nice as a hinged back of course, but still easy to load. The Soki 3s, they have a spool that can drop out, so watch out for that if you're buying a used one. See if the spool is still there. Benefits of a removable back is also that you can check the curtains better with a flashlight in a dark room, for example. So, keeping the overall look, growing in size, bigger top plate since the rangefinder viewfinder is combined. It has a big viewfinder with high magnification, corresponds to a 50 millimeter view or thereabouts. 15 times magnification. Thicker as you can see, also heavier at 550 grams. Not possible to put upside down as they for some reason chose not to recess the cold shoe into the top plate. This is not a very well serviced camera, this particular 3M, so the knob is a bit rough to wind. This is how it looks, big magnification. This particular camera had fungus in the viewfinder at first, which had to be cleaned out and some dirt. Pretty weak rangefinder spot. But if you find one in good condition, it has one of the best finders of the Soviet rangefinder cameras. Next up was the Sorky 4 and there was also a version made that's called the Mir. It is, I think, about the same camera. It has a self timer. It has a new kind of knob. It has 1000 of a second. It has diopter correction. Keeping all those things from the 3M. Flash sync is new, which is probably why they changed the look of it. The knob is worse in my opinion, it's not as nice to grip. Unlike the Zoki 4, the Mir does not have slow speeds, probably a cost cutting measure, but it is to our benefit, as the Mir should be less prone to malfunction if you happen to change shutter speed before cocking the shutter. It still has the same type of film spool that can fall out. I like the look of the Mir. It is of course a lot bigger than the camera it evolved from, but it does have its charm. Thicker, wider and taller. And of course, as you can suspect from its looks, it's not the best for putting upside down. The knob is, as I said earlier, not as easy to grip and I haven't had a lot of these cameras so I don't know how easy they can be to wind. This is still nice, knob winds are always nice, but it's not as fast. The viewfinder of this specimen is really nice. Well. The coverage is about 0 0.8 maybe, so and the eye point is not that good since magnification is so high, but it's still a very nice viewfinder to look through. But you, you, it's not ideal for composing. So next up, the Sorky 4K, the last development on this line. On this stage, we've reached the late 70s in the Soviet Union. So the, the closer we get to the fall of this empire, the, the lower the quality of the goods produced. It's almost as if you could have predicted the fall by seeing how long things were made to last. The first Sork is 50 years and these last ones maybe 10 or 
one or if they worked at all. The Sorky 4K is, I think, a nice camera to look at. It added a lever wind, but that lever wind is not very nice. It's fast enough, but it just doesn't feel right. The camera is quite big and you can somehow feel that overall quality is lower than the earlier ones. The film spool doesn't fall out anymore. That is an improvement. But it still has this shutter system that you have to wind the shutter before setting the shutter speed. Otherwise you might damage the shutter. So winding pretty fast but it doesn't inspire confidence. The viewfinder is... The tint is bluer and I think the contrast is worse than the mirror. Might depend on the copy, but uh, my feel is that the viewfinder on the 4K is of a lower quality than the earlier Sorky 4 and Mir cameras. The nicest one I've had is from a Sorky 3, the first version. Still high magnification, so if you like that, this could be the camera for you. The Fed factory was the other factory, main factory making uh, Leica copies. The first development was the Fed 2. Here the first version of the Fed 2, very nice clean design, knob wind, one five hundredth of a second. It has a combined viewfinder rangefinder, shutter speeds with one five hundredth of a second to one twenty or twenty five. And the dial that you know you can see the shutter speed set both before and after cocking the shutter diopter correction the hot shoe is recessed into the body it has a wide rangefinder base about the same as a leica m it is bigger than the like a 2 Model D in all respects. It is wider, taller and thicker since, since it has a removable back. You cannot put it upside down as it is not a bottom loader. It's, there's no point in that really. Remove the back, you twist these two levers or whatever you call them and just remove it. The film spool is removable but it sits quite firmly in place. Build quality on these fed twos are generally good and winding them is most of the time just a wonderful experience. So a very nice design, but there are some problems with the feds. The Fed 2 has a 0.7 times magnified finder. It is pretty dark, but contrast is really good. So it is easy to see where you have the rangefinder patch. Unfortunately, the view is quite dull. So you have to be prepared for that. It is specified as the Sorky 5 and 6, but the finders of the Sorkis are much nicer in my opinion. And one thing is the rangefinder cam of the lenses. And here you can see that they are a bit thinner in some lenses than on certain Soviet ones, especially those made in the Fed factory. So if you look at the rangefinder lever there, there's a space in the top. It is placed a bit higher on the Sorky cameras. Something that can cause some problems with some lenses. 
all of the lenses made for the Fed 2 originally work okay, but with some other ones like this, this Elmar, you can get quite a bit of resistance and I don't know if I really trust the rangefinder measurement in these cases. Here you can see on the Sorky, it is perfectly smooth. So there is one problem. Another one is that of the placement of the shutter button when you have a wide rangefinder base. As you can see on this original one, you don't interfere with the rangefinder window at all. On the Fed 2, well, you want to put your finger right where the rangefinder window is, which makes the rangefinder patch disappear when you look through it. So you have to put your hand in a way that is not intuitively how you would hold it. And that is something of a problem. It, it, it is a small problem, but it is a problem. On the Sorky 5, they chose a different solution. They could have put the shutter button there, but instead they moved it out to the side, which actually makes it makes you move the finger away from the rangefinder window to some extent. It is not as nice to hold it, but it's, it is a trade-off. You can use the button placed more centrally to release the shutter as well, but it is mostly used for rewinding the film. It's not very comfortable. Another problem with having the shutter release so close to the shutter speed dial is that you can interfere with it if you have gloves especially. And this is the case for all cameras with a rotating shutter speed dial situated close to the shutter release. On the Sorky 5 and 6 you do not have that problem since they are so far apart. Clever Sorky. The Fed 3 tried to solve this by reducing the rangefinder base length which made it ergonomically better but as they kept the viewfinder magnification the effective base got shorter that is maybe not a big problem considering the lenses made for the fed with a 50 millimeter f 2.8 as standard but the camera also grew in size and would continue to grow as we can see in this fed 5c so the feds evolved we have we jump up a bit in time to the fed 5c which was produced until late in the 90s here we have all the modernities added which I don't think we really need anymore. It has a self timer, it has a light meter, which as it is selenium, most often doesn't work now. It is not coupled, but you can take readings from, from up there. It has, as you take readings and then you set it according to those readings. It has a lever wind which you can put out like that, but it doesn't stay in that place after winding. It has a, the lever wind is actually quite nice on this camera. The back is removable. The spool stays in place. Size has increased a lot in this camera. It is actually quite a big camera compared to where it started off. Winding is okay, but 
the placement of the shutter button is a bit awkward. gets better with one of these plastic things on top. The Fed 5C has frame lines, but they are not parallax corrected. It has the darkish, dullish finder of the Feds with good contrast of range finder, but pretty non-inspiring view overall. In the 50s, when the Soviets tried to be best at everything. They made some interesting cameras. For example, this made at the GOMS factory, the Leningrad camera. It has a pretty wide rangefinder base. It added some nice features, especially this spring-driven shutter release, which was supposed to be able to deliver 20 images in a row, three images a second. Unfortunately, my camera broke down just before this test. So it is, there are downsides to this system. Most obviously is the size. The Leningrad is a very big camera. Pretty nice to hold though, as it has some kind of grip. The back is removable, but you have to turn some rings more than the other removable back cameras. It looks like this, the spool is not going anywhere as it is part of the mechanism for fast shooting it was of course something of a revolution but the spring mechanism is very big so you have to kind of wrap your finger around it it had a viewfinder with frame lines that are actually parallax corrected horizontally and there are frames for 50 85 and 135 millimeters. You can use the outer limits of the frame for 35 millimeter, but it is, well, it doesn't really cover 35. And the eye point is a trouble there. It's very hard to see the edges of the frame. There was also the Droog, uh, rangefinder camera with the viewfinder in the center, which of course made it easier for left-eyed shooters or equally difficult for everyone. It has this Leica bit or Canon inspired rapid winding system. The whole camera is looks to be pretty much inspired by the Canon cameras of the time. It has a hinged back. No spool falling out. Pretty big camera, heavy especially, pretty nice design though. The weakness of this camera is the rapid wind system because there are no spare parts and there's constant wear on these cogs or whatever you call it from this chain. So if the chain or cog break, well, I think it would be pretty hard to repair this one. As you can see, pretty inspired from the Canon cameras. Here's a Canon P. They have the same look on the, on the side, the removal back. As the Canons also had this rapid wind system available. It's not difficult to think where inspiration came from. Winding is of course quick. You can imagine that for press photographers this was a very nice camera to use it has a one-to-one -one magnification and frame lines for 50 and 85 they are moving in this image but they are not parallax corrected it's just a camera that's moving these are all enjoyable cameras and prices are very reasonable if you just want a cheap rangefinder camera with a 50mm lens, the safest bet would be a Fed 2, preferably the version without self-timer, equipped with an Industar lens. If you want to use other lenses, Zorkis are a wiser choice than Feds. 
If you want a high magnification finder, a well-serviced Soke 3M is a nice choice. If you want a good finder for composing, as well as easy film loading, a Soke 6 could be the camera for you. The Soke 5 is a great bottom loader, only held back by its lever wind. But in the end, rangefinder photography is about small cameras and wider angles. When it comes to ergonomics and compactness, there is no competition. If you add an auxiliary finder to that, the result is even clearer. The best camera was there, right from the beginning. To conclude, I would say that rangefinder photographers of today should be grateful that the Soviet economy was as stagnant as it was. Unfortunately, it was not stagnant enough. Just imagine if they had produced 11 million copies of the Leica II Model D instead of just 1.5.